Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to join this room here with me, Pius Kojobaka. Coming up this afternoon, Ghana Armed Forces warns any further attacks on its personnel and installations will be met with what, what it calls appropriate response following clash with youth of Tema Newtown on Friday night. Two men were alleged to have been shot by the Navy during the incident, prompting anger. Also in this bullet, Electoral Commission says theft of five of its election laptops will pose no threat to elections as it says staff are suspected to be responsible have been handed over to the national security and police for investigations. Meanwhile, the opposition NDC says the commission is not being truthful about missing machines and will continue to push until the truth comes out. Also in this bulletin, MPP's winning candidate in yesterday's Ejusu primaries, Kwabna Bwaten rallies support from his competitors to retain the seat as he says, his victory is for all residents of Ejusu, especially the eight others who mounted a challenge for the party's mandate to lead them into the April 30 um, by-elections. Elsewhere, tensions in Middle East boost the world on high alert following Iranian attack on Israel last night. We have details of these and many others coming your way all in a moment. Please stay. Thanks so much for your company. I am Pius Kojo Baka. To our very first story, the Ghana Armed Forces has warned that any further attacks on its installations or personnel by the youth of Tema Newtown would be met with what it calls the appropriate response. And it follows what the force says, the two attacks by the youth on this installation in reaction to the death of two civilians allegedly shot dead by the Ghana Navy during the climax of the Tema Kulejo Festival Friday night. And we've got a statement to share with you here on the channel. And the statement um, reads, um, a vehicle belonging to the Eastern Naval Command of the Ghana Navy was attacked by a crowd partaking in an ongoing festival at Tema Newtown at about 7.53 p.m. on Friday, 12 April 2024, leading to the damage of the vehicle. Now, three of the naval personnel on board the vehicle also sustained severe injuries and were sent to the Tema Naval Base Medical Center for treatment. In the course of the confrontation, three suspects were arrested by the naval personnel. Now, they were subsequently handed over to the Tema Newtown District Police for further investigations. It goes on to read that the mob suspected to be part of the participants in the festivities and later attacked the Tema Naval Base with stones and other implements um, with the main aim of releasing their colleagues. At a stage, the security of the base was threatened and in order to project the sensitive installations in the base. Now, warning shots were fired to repel the attack. It was later reported by the police that two civilians were brought to the Tema General Hospital dead. The cause of the death is yet to be ascertained. Again, on Saturday 13th, April 2024, the mob attacked the Tema Naval Base and the Naval Barracks in Atema, Newtown, um, leading to the destruction of property. Now, the statement goes on to read that the Ghana Police Service, in collaboration with the Ghana Armed Forces, have commenced investigations into the incident. Findings of the investigations would be made available in due course. The Ghana Armed Forces commensurates with the bereaved families and urges to be uh, maintained by all parties while the incident is being investigated. And that was signed by the Director General of Public Relations of the Ghana Armed Forces, um, Agri Kwashi, Brigadier General. Well, yesterday, Director of the Public Relations at the Ghana Navy, Captain Andy Lanyani, who spoke to join news before the Ghana Armed Forces statement, denied claims that the Navy killed the two men. And we know that um, the youth have been meeting the security authorities on this matter, and pretty soon they will join us for some update. But first, let's get to speak to our co uh, my colleague uh, with Adom News, Kwame Yanka, who has been monitoring developments in that area for us. Kwame Yanka, thanks so much for joining me on Join Newsroom. Quickly tell me what the mood is really in Tema Newtown as to speak. 
Unfortunately, we lost um, Kwame Yanka. We shall connect to Kwame Yanka as and when we do have him. Also joining us is Oko Oninku Henry, youth activist and youth spokesperson for Tema Traditional Council. And he was part of the procession and all deliberations that had followed um, this incident. Thanks so much, Henry, for your time. Now, what happened uh, between the engagement you had with the authorities after this incident? Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Um, before I proceed with uh, what really happened on the grounds, let me use this very opportunity to say a very big story and also express our deepest condolences to the bereaved family. Like you rightly mentioned, I was part of the procession. I was with them. And then one of the deceased persons actually shared water with me five minutes before the incident happened. So let me use this very opportunity to once again say our deepest condolences to them and may their souls rest in perfect peace. They're actually fighting for Tema. They were celebrating a festival for the people of Tema and they have lost their lives. So yeah. Tema is really proud of them and Tema will support them with the list and with our, our, our last breaths. So like you said, we have had a series of meetings. Um, the Tema Traditional Council yesterday met some political figures, the Greater Accra Regional Minister, the Executive Honorable Daniel Quartet, as a global came with, it, with his entourage. The Member of Parliament in the person of Honorable Isaac Ashaw Damtin was also there with his entourage. And then the um, MC, that is the Mayor of Tema, Honorable Yuan Yamashiti, was also there with entourage and a couple of traditional leaders and then a bereaved family. We met at the Tema Traditional Council first and foremost. They want to ascertain what really, really happened we being high eyewitnesses of the incident, we, we give them first hand information. And from there, we moved to the bereaved families. These political figures are mentioned in collaboration with the youth of the community and also the people of Tema moved to the bereaved families. We, we went to console them and then express our, our deepest condolences to the family. From there, there was another meeting that was a closed door meeting held at the Eastern Naval Command with the hierarchy of the eastern um the never base to be precise but on a more serious note um we were it was quite unfortunate something of that sort happened because we have been with the navy for quite some number of years now i grew up as i said my new time boy who knows the pivotal role the eastern never command or the navy plays as far as security of this very nation is concerned and i can tell you as a matter of fact that there has never been an incident like this where shooting indiscriminately to the crowd. Uh, like you said, I was a high witness to everything that happened. Yes, in their statements, they mentioned that Tema youth attacked the naval base, which is never true. I am saying this on authority, I'm saying this on national television, that everything that happened, you know, when we are doing our possession, we come in our chunk numbers. Everybody that has witnessed either um, Tema Pilejo or this Teshi Pilejo and things, we are always have youth coming in their numbers. So, um, let me commend the Ghana Police Service for a good job done because all these processes that we've been doing, you see the Ghana Police Service in and out. And when they are coming with their vehicles, with their motorbikes, with their arms and everything, they don't just approach us as if we are thieves. But this vehicle, this um, military vehicle I'm talking about, actually came and they met us with a speed. The speed with which they met the crowd after we've been able to stop the car. In fact, if it is to be killing, they would have killed some of us. So the guys also took it upon themselves and they started hitting the, the, the H200 van belonging to the, to the military. So right after that, being their leader, I went there and I calmed them. And there's this military guy who knows me. He mentioned my name, Future MP Nee, and he said it in a local dialect. Come on, no, we BFA. So I calmed them and I asked them that you have mentioned my name, Nee, and the way you are speaking gun shows that you understand the culture and the tradition of the people. We have done three pillage already last week. This is the final pillage. So why should your vehicles be moving speed with us to, to that extent? So I calmed them initially. Yes, I realized a screen of their vehicle has been broken. So I told them that since I am the leader and I have witnessed what has happened, I want them to drive their car back into their base. I followed them to the entrance. They didn't allow me in. But I told them that I have witnessed everything that has happened. So the next morning, I'll take them to the traditional leaders. And whatever being the case, their car is going to be fixed. So like I said, my group has already moved. We have two groups on the road. My group has already moved. The group that they had that, um, I mean, that banter with, the group has already moved. And another group was coming. So I went back to inform the group that was coming that this is what has happened as far as the military and the Pelejo boys are concerned. So I just want them to pass 
and 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 I mean they pass in a peaceful manner. But one thing I want everybody to know is that looking at the principal streets of Tema, as far as our possessions and our rights are concerned, we use that front lane of the Eastern Naval Command. So it is actually not our first time using that command, as far as some others and some other media reportage are saying. You get it. So mm. we use that place almost each and every time we are having our festival. And we've used that for about three days now. So when we got there, the other group that was coming, after having a word with them, I told them to move in an in amicable manner. So they passed. I was the last person. I was waiting for the last person to pass before I leave there. I mean, the military base. I was there. I think I have him. I was there, and the only thing I saw, I was there, and the only thing I was I saw was that the military men came out of the, the base, and they arrested about six guys. So quickly, I went to them. I was like, honorable, seniors, these people you have arrested, they have nothing to do with the incidents that happened. Like I said, I have communicated with you. They have broken your screen. I'll take you to the traditional council, and we are going to solve this. In fact, in my presence, they started beating the boys. I mean, using guns everywhere. I saw everything. They were just hitting them with guns everywhere. And the only thing I heard one military man saying is that if you don't leave here, I'll slap you. And I didn't see this person because he was in mask. So, in fact, personally, I have to, I have to run for my life first. And when you get to their entrance, there's one military man at the top there. When the guys realize that some guys have been, have been arrested, they came back with the mindset of coming to plead on their behalf. Quickly, the guy at the top shouted, be on alert and be on guard. This was the message from the guy at the top with his gun fixed. And they started shooting. Initially, what I saw, they were shooting into the air. But the six military men that came out of the base, they were not targeting and they were shooting. That is when I had to run for my life. So hmm. there is another alternating route that leads to the station. But in this case, you are using the Mahia Polyclinic. That is the... the, the how do you call it? The, the health sector. So I, I quickly I quickly ran to this um, health sector we are talking about. And I, I got there and I realized that we have some three guys that are being rushed to the health sector. I approached them. I realized that two of them had wounds at their ribs. So the nurse on duty automatically asked them to get an ambulance and transfer them to Tema General Hospital. So... I left the two of them, one guy escorted them to the Thermal General Hospital, and I was with the three who sustained gun wounds at their legs and their thighs. Mm. Unfortunately, around 12 a.m., I came back to report the case to the traditional leaders, and um, I think around 12 there about, we had a call that the regional minister designates the member of parliament and the mayor were at the Thermal General Hospital, and unfortunately, the two people that were sent to the Thermal General Hospital for medical attention were pronounced dead. And a, the, the, the district commander was also there with the member of parliament and the regional minister, and they confirmed that these are gunshot wounds. So with the communique that we are seeing from the Eastern Naval Command trying to cook their own story, we know definitely they will have their way through. These are some of the things that they'll be saying. But like I'm saying, I was an eyewitness. I saw everything. I saw the firing indiscriminately, but I have to fight for my life as far as that very incident is concerned. All right, so um, um, Henry, kindly hold on for me and let's take a listen to the Director of Public Relations at the Ghana Navy, Captain Andy Lanani, who spoke to Joy News before um, they issued the statement denying claims that the Navy really killed the two men. About two guys from the mob were injured, were hit in the thigh, and they were treated at the hospital. But it came to us as a surprise when um, we learned that um, two persons were sent to the Temajuna Hospital and they were pronounced dead. Mm. We, so far as we know, we don't know whether whoever, I mean, whatever killed them, and that one will be left with the police to continue with their investigations to unravel whatever, because what we are also hearing is that some, um, they were stabbed. And if it is a stab, a stab wound that killed them, then we can't say that it was a gunshot wound. All right, so Henry, you heard the um, um, concerns of the Ghana Armed Forces, specifically the Navy, responding to those claims you made. But fast forward, uh, you've had engagement with the uh, uh, top security hierarchy on this matter. What has come out of it? I, 
I didn't get that question, sir. I didn't get it. I'm asking you to tell us um, what has come out of the meeting you've had with the uh, military and, of course, the uh, regional uh, minister, as you rightly said. Okay, so the first meeting we heard, that was um, early hours of yesterday, was between the regional minister, the mayor, and the MP, Honorable Isaac Ashawadamti. And the purpose of the meeting was to ascertain if what they heard was really true and then also um, console the bereaved family, which we have done this morning. The traditional leaders led by Nia Jiti Agbu II has again visited the bereaved families. And yesterday, the meeting that was held at the Eastern Naval Command, that is with the Navy authorities, I, was, I, I told you, I reported it was actually a closed door meeting because they claim it is a, it is a, a security um, apparatus kind of a meeting. So the regional minister and the um, hierarchy of the, of the Navy Command were those that held the meeting. But then they have given us assurance that um, this basically they, they are going to do everything possible to, to find justice or to seek for justice for these bereaved families. And then one thing is that with the communicate that is actually coming out from Eastern Naval Command, they, the communicate sounds as if it is the youth of Tema that is actually attacking, I mean, the Naval Base. Yes, we know when it comes to ammunition, we don't come close to them. We know when it comes to training, we don't come close to them. So there's no way the youth of Tema, as far as the leaders, as far as I am concerned and other leaders are concerned, we take the law into our own hands. In fact, yesterday, what happened if we had wanted to retaliate? We know most of them reside with us in the community. Most of them are personally, I have a tenant who is the military officer he's in my room. In fact, some, some others can take the law into their own hands and then do whatever they want to do. But we decided, we had a meeting with the, with the youth groups. Even this morning, we have met some of them. We have told them that our brother's lives, in fact, has already been wasted. Nobody must die for another person to die. Now, the police, the regional police commander, Greater Accra Regional Police Commander, has made it known that he would, I mean, try as much as possible and make sure that he finds justice for this diseased family. So, on a more serious note, like they are saying, and you, when you look at the last communique from the Brigadier General, the last word he used, it's quite unfortunate that if the youth of them are tries to come, I mean, attack, they will attack in response. Now, we are, this is conflict resolution. We are finding solutions to this very problem. So for you to issue such community or for you to end your community with such words, you know, accumulated grievances of the youth can also, I mean, do a different thing altogether. But we are pleading with the appropriate bodies. We are pleading with the inferior minister. We are pleading with the defense ministry. We are pleading with the presidency, the Tema Youth Association and other youth groups in Tema. In the days coming, we'll petition these appropriate bodies I have, I have mentioned. It is not a crime to celebrate our festivals. Those militaries on guard that night that unfit this um, unprofessional act was displayed. They all come from a typical traditional homes. When they go back to their communities, they enjoy their festivals, they enjoy their celebrations. Why should they invade in our celebrations as well? But I am giving you my words as far as join news and other media platforms are concerned that the youth of Tema will never take the law into our own hands. We are law abiding citizens. And for your, I mean, for your viewers, I mean, for well, viewers who doesn't know, we had similar issues, I think some years back in the month of August, when it was time for the Homo War Festival. We lost, we lost two lives. Currently, as I speak to you now, there has not been any proper measures. There has not been any proper communique from the Ghana Post and Abbas Authority, even the presidency, even parliament. There has not been anything of that sort. So the bigger question is that must we be losing our lives as far as our celebrations are concerned? Now, this land we are talking about, the land the Navy is occupying now, everything they are occupying now was given All to right. them by the Tema Traditional so Council. Nee, your point is well made, but quickly, in a minute, if you can do that for me, what next now? We know that, yes, um, yesterday we had a closed-door meeting with the security hierarchy there. What next do we know? You know so basically, like we are saying, the um, Greater Accra Regional Police Command has made it emphatically clear that this lies within his bosom and his jurisdiction as the commander for the region. He is going to do that in collaboration with the Greater Accra Regional Minister, the Metropolitan Security Council, that is the MESEC and the members of parliament as far as this very constituency is concerned. So the, the, the belief is that tomorrow being Monday, the traditional council will meet again. Since then, we're having um, urgent and emergency meetings. This morning we had one, and I'm sure probably by tomorrow, the, 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 the Ghana Police Service, the, the regional command and the minister and the various ministries I have mentioned will definitely try as much as possible and tell us something better as far as the youth is concerned. But I'm saying this again, that no youth in Tema right. has decided or is actually deciding to take the law into his own hands. That's fine. Thank you so much, Oko, uh, Oninko Henry, spokesperson for the youth um, in Tema, speaking to us there. Thanks so much. And the incident we are learning, uh, Christopher Amo,
40 years old, father of five. His relative says um, he was on his way from work when he was hit. And Janet Amo is a sister, joins us via phone to speak to us on this. And um, Janet, thanks so much for your time. And I don't know whether to say it's a good afternoon to you, but really sad one for uh, us here to hear that we've lost a relative. Now, you say your relative, Chris, was hit by a bullet from the gun of the Ghana Navy officer, right? Tell us what you know about it so far. Yeah, so, um, I mean, per eyewitness, which is my sister and my mom, who um, had calls that evening, and then they, 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 they were told what had happened, and they rushed to the hospital. I mean, per what they saw, and then the... the, the pictures that my sister took with her own phone and that of the husband shows that this is a bullet and this is not actually a knife stabbing. You understand? Now mm. we have my brother said he was he was actually from work and then he decided to, to join them for a short while to have fun before getting home. And so he was in a jacket and then you could see that he was also in a reflector because of where he worked. He worked at the port so he was in a reflector. Now, from the, uh, the, the, the picture of the dress, or even I have the dress with me, unfortunately I can't show that to you, but I can show that to you on WhatsApp. Now, there's a hole in the jacket. This is not a knife. I mean, it is a knife. You see it in a line form, but this is a hole. And then with the picture that my sister also took with her own phone before the body was taken to the courtroom, you could see that on his chest there is a hole. You understand? Hmm. So the, 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 the community on, on social media, whatever we are seeing on social media that they are saying is a nice cabin and they, 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 they try to, um, to fight the, the Navy and so on and so forth. That, that is something that is unfortunate. I mean, it's very, very unfortunate. We are trying to let the people know that we are seeking justice. All right. We know that people were on duty that day. We know that people are going to get into trouble, but they shouldn't also forget that a life has been lost, which we cannot replace with anything. We know we are Christians, that death is inevitable, though. But, I mean, you can't help somebody to end this life. This is, this is an um, accident that could be avoided. All right. And so we are seeking justice. We've already been visited by uh, some traditional council members, some some authorities like the, the regional minister and other people have come to us. They've come us down. They've told us they're going to have meetings and they'll get back to us. But what we are saying is we need justice. That's all. All right. Thank you very much, Janet Amu, a relative of the deceased, speaking to us on the back of that. And we are following keenly on this story and we'll keep you updated in our subsequent bulletins. Let's move on to some other stories. The Electoral Commission says the theft of five of its election devices will pose no threat to elections. The NDC has for weeks been pushing for the EC to come clean on the missing devices, alleging the machines in wrong hands could compromise the presidential and parliamentary elections due to uh, basically later this year. But speaking on news analysis show News File on Joy News yesterday, Director of Electoral Services at the EC, Dr. Sribo Kweku, said there was no threat whatsoever. When you pick the uh, laptop, it's like a laptop. Unless all the systems are put together before they become a kit. And when they are a kit, you need to be given activation code before you can link them to the system. And the one who is going to do the voting will also have to be biometrically be empowered into the system before it could be used. So if you, if, if you take the whole BVR, they have no effect mm. because they don't have the activation code. And the whoever is going to use it will, will not have access to the to link into the data system. So you have not had the opportunity to use these five to complement the kits to be able to do the end of life. No, we have done. We have finished. We have done that. We have finished. We did, did the last time we used the kits. Mm. Uh, some of the kits because we have eight thousand five hundred, mm -hmm. and we used around thousand for the twenty twenty three. So the seven thousand the rest were no use. Right. So if I stand here, I will not be able to tell whether the five were part of the one that was used for 2003. So there's no cause for concern at, at all. all? Not at all. Absolutely at not. At all. The, the cause we have is that Ghana has lost laptops. Mm. And it's a cost in terms of financial cost to the state. 
And that is why we, uh, whenever we lose such things, we report to the police. He also revealed that the staff suspected to have been involved in the theft have been handed over to the national security and the police for further investigations and will be put before court if the involvement is confirmed. We ourselves suspected some of our own staff, mm. reported them to national security, and national security took them up now with the police. And as I, I speak, they are, I know they have done it, and very soon they'll be arraigned before the court. Well, the explanations did little to assert the feelings of the opposition NDC, which maintains that the EC is not being truthful. Director of Elections at the NDC, Dr. Edward Omani Buama, who also spoke on news files, said the NDC will file a right to information question to the Electoral Commission on this matter. The EC's attempt, and I'll say it bluntly, to lie to the good people of Ghana that even no BVDs were, were missing itself was also disingenuous. When in actual fact, on, at IPAC, it became obvious that even some BVDs are also missing. It tells us that so long as they can use BVR, BVD, to confuse the uninitiated, and they succeeded in doing that, we tried to let people understand the distinction between the mm. two, they were okay, I revert. Samson. We will file an RTI okay. on this. All right. We will also mm. send mm. the questions officially one okay. more time All right. to the EC. Okay. And we will push to the farthest extent, mm. as our national chairman has indicated, okay. an independent audit of the EC's IT system will be non-negotiable. Vain assurances from the Electoral Commission of Ghana will not cut it for the NDC. And to some other stories, the winning candidate of yesterday's Ejisu primaries of the governing New Patriotic Party, Kwabna Boateng, says his victory is for all residents of Ejisu, especially the eight others who mounted a challenge for the party's mandate to lead them into the April 30 by-elections. The seat is traditionally an MPP one, and the party is expected to win comfortably. Ahead of that, Kwabna Boateng says all must join hands in retaining the seat for the party. Nanaya Ojima monitored the vote. And here is his report. Mamiya Abwajewa managed to garner 229 votes, with Dr. Evans Dia polling 61 votes. Former president of the Ghana Football Association, Kwesi Nyantechi had 35 votes, with Portia Echampon polling 6 votes. Aaron Prince Dia and Klensman Kakari Mensa together polled 4 votes. Abana Pokuya Amua Boaite who is making a fourth attempt, could not manage a vote. Kwabna Boateng, who emerged victorious, shared a few words. The victory is for all of us, especially the other candidates. We are here to serve the people of Ejoso. We will work towards victory. I am grateful to you all. On two occasions, Kobna Boateng challenged the process resulting in some chaos. Earlier, there were reports that the former GFA president, Christine Antechi, was admitted at the hospital. Despite the ill health, he managed to show up at the grounds. Regional chairman, Bernard Nkibo Siako is requesting for party unity to make a statement in the by-election. Lawyer go, lawyer come. And see, I just saw Kasa, police station for Kasa. Now, me catch them and say, me wamu muji diye. The people of Ejuso have spoken. The polling station executives have made a bold statement. I believe in their choice. I am ensuring peace among them. 
in 17 days time we will take the candidate to the polls some of the aspirants congratulated the winner of the election prince aaron dia explains the reason for his defeat yes he is a second vice chair of our party so definitely he's in the race those who just came in we don't know them but this one we know him he's been with us he's been campaigning with us so it's a fair deal very disappointed because i know what i've done i know my work but it won't put me back i will move forward organize myself i have to get money and I'll, i'm going to do that i was expecting a, like over 100 votes i told you that i tore i visited the delegates they bought my message and i can assure you i can tell you that my message helped uh, the one who won yes I told the delegate they should elect one of our own, one we know, one who have been working with us. You must have campaigned against your own self. For Joy News, Nanaya Ojima Ejoso. Away from the Ashanti region, the Roads and Highways Ministry says it has completed investigations into allegations of organized crime at the ministry. The claims were made by former GIMPA rector Professor Stephen Adai in October last year. I've got a statement to share with you on your screens pretty soon. And the statement, there you go, captured Professor Stephen Adair's allegation of organized crime against the Ministry of Roads and Highways, unsubstantiated and highly presumptions. Now, the Ministry of Roads and Highways wishes to bring to the attention of the public that the Economic and Organized Crime Office, in a letter dated 21, 21st March 2024, with reference number, there you go with the reference number, informed the ministry that the completed, uh, it's completed its investigations into the allegations of organized crime at the Ministry of Roads and Highways made by Professor Stephen Adai in October 2023. It goes on to read that Yoko has concluded its investigations and Yoko has determined that from the totality of the uh, Available information of the office. Stephen Adai's comments were found to be unfortunate and general within the context of perceived corruption in the country. End of quote. In a separate development, NDC MP for Senate West, Kwame Chumisi Ampofo, says the Minister for Roads and Highways, Francis Asensubwachi, peddled falsehood when he claimed the NPP government constructed the Atibubu. Now, the Kwame Dazu Road, speaking to journalists in Parliament, the MP insisted that the road was rather constructed by the Eswell NDC administration under President John Mahama and not the current government, as the minister claimed during the meeting with chiefs of the area. Minister of Road and Highways went to Kwame Danso on the 4th of April, just last week. I think he's touring some of the roads within the region. And when he got to the palace of Gamayne, in front of the palace, the, in front of the paramount chief and his chiefs and elders, the minister was able to lie vividly to tell Ghanaians that his MPP who did the role, who constructed a table Kwame Dansu Road and then Kwame Dansu Kaiji Road, which I need to set the record straight. That is not true. But my worry was in front of Nananom and the good people of Senate West and the entire Ghanaians and the world, the minister couldn't properly check his hand over nose before going for this inspection. And when the minister said the road was constructed by the MPP, then the people at the back were saying that, no, it wasn't. It was His Excellency President Mama did the road. Before the deputy minister was able to whisper to the minister that they did not do the road. And even in correct, correcting, the, or the correcting the message, he said they started.
And more on our roads, Transport Minister Kuku Furisiyama is imploring sector heads and agencies in the transport sector to pursue aggressive communication on government's huge infrastructural interventions in the transport sector. According to him, despite the huge investments government has made in the transport sector, most of the beneficiary communities appear not to be aware of the projects. He was addressing stakeholders at the 2024 strategic review meeting in Cape Coast. We have upgraded the Tamari Airport into an international status. We have re rehabilitated Sudani Airport Phase 1. We are going to Phase 2. Completed the construction of Terminal 3 project at Kotoka International Airport. Expanded the Kumasi Airport into an international status, which is near completion, and will be taking over. Established an independent body responsible for aircraft accident, incident and accident investigation and prevention. Transport Minister Kweko Foriesiyama enumerating some of the interventions that have been made in the transport sector. The minister says in spite of the huge infrastructural intervention pumped in by government since its assumption of office in 2017, most of the beneficiary communities appear not to have seen what has been done by government. He warned the chief directors and agency heads to rise to the occasion. There's a popular saying that if you don't tell your story, Someone else went. Not too long ago, the ministry conducted a, a rapid evaluation of the coastal fish landing site project. Surprisingly, despite the huge investment that we've made, majority of the people interviewed within the beneficial communities were not even aware of the project. The truth is that at times, or perhaps we have not been able to tell our story well, Therefore, going forward, I urge all of you to put forward an aggressive communication strategy to create awareness on the programs and projects of the sector. By so doing, it gives us confidence in declaring and demonstrating the good worth of the president as we seek the mandate of the people. I also wish to charge the board and management to ensure that there is no labor unrest during this period, there should be regular engagement with workers to address their issues to avoid rumors which spark off such unwarranted workers' agitation. At the same time, I'm also urging workers not to put undue pressure on management. Head of Civil Service, Dr. Evans Agreda, urged the civil servant to be meticulous in their dealings to avert negative consequences. When you are striking a synergy between development and democracy, you have a big problem. It's not a problem, it's a challenge, and it can be surmounted. One, we are dealing with much more sophisticated citizens who are coming in with new and wide demands. Their expectations are high. They are comparing with other systems. They are comparing other sectors. They are comparing other services they are receiving from other institutions, organizations, and you know, jurisdictions across the globe. Don't forget that governments have also come to come under serious pressure. And the democracy dictates that from time to time, our governments will come to the people, will subject them to the test of acceptability. Important ingredient of good governance. So every four years, our leaders will go and account for their stewardship. Central Regional Minister Justina Marigodasan was hopeful the numerous interventions rolled out by government will help in transforming the sector. In our daily diverse endeavors, transportation brings people together, fostering social interactions, cultural exchange and community engagement. It is my prayer that the challenges confronting the sector would find lasting and sustainable solutions through the strategic review meeting. The transport sector review meeting assessed the performance of the transport sector, examined the prospects in the sector, and mapped out strategies to deal with the challenge. This is still joining us room. Asante Hino 2482 II is requesting the Rotary International Club in Ghana to remain poised in charting a good course to foster environmental sustainability for the country. The two four prevailed on the group to complement efforts by the government in instituting social interventions aligned with the Sustainable Development Goals to empower the youth and improve the lives of Ghanaians. 
He spoke at the first district conference of the Rotary International District 9104 held in the Ashanti region. The first district conference of the Rotary International District 9104 brought together national leadership and members of the club from across the country. The event was to celebrate the achievements of the club in the preceding year and set out plans for the new year. Speaking at the event, the Asantehene, Otun Fosetu to the second, commended the club for their enormous efforts in feeling change in the country through the Sustainable Development Goals. He particularly highlighted the club's role in improving the educational, agricultural and other sectors of the country's economy. Rotary is focused on providing sustainable water solutions and improving sanitation has transformed many lives. The link help directly to access to clean water that's significantly uplifting community well-being and reducing waterborne illness. In the field of education, Rotary's efforts to construct schools, award scholarships, and support literacy have opened the vast horizons of hope and opportunity for Ghanaian youth. This investment is pivotal, empowering our future leaders to dream and achieve on a grander scale. The Asantehene, however, charged the club to refocus their efforts to enhancing sanitation and committing to avenues for youth empowerment while calling for collaboration between the group, government and civil organizations. Focusing on new leadership and entrepreneurship promises to unlock the immense potential of Ghana's vibrant youth, driving innovation and progress. Addressing health challenges beyond polio, including malaria, HIV, AIDS, and new emerging health concerns remains imperative. Rotary's continued efforts are essential in building robust healthcare systems accessible to all. Collaborative efforts are vital to surmounting our complex challenges. Rotary can magnify its impact by forging stronger bonds with government, the private sector, and civil society, achieving sustainable and impactful outcomes. District Governor of Rotary International District 9104, David Osea Mankwa Jr., reaffirmed the club's commitment to improve the social and economic status of Ghanaians. Service above self. We are giving to humanity everything or as much as we can give in our little way. I said before that we are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. We provide a network of resources and we provide it to the community, assess their needs and we provide it to them. So we give micro loans to small groups and we, we track how they are doing and we support them. In addition, we give them all sorts of literacy skills. It's a form of economic empowerment to support them in the work that they do. The Rotary International District 9104 is working to inject more youth into its membership as it works to charter more clubs to the existing ones. For Joy News, my name is Emmanuel Bright Quiku. And I'm Pius Kojobaka. We are pausing for a breather. We'll be right back with this. Hello, welcome back to Joy Newsroom. We can now take some business stories. Stakeholders in the aquaculture industry are calling on the government to equip laboratories across the country with the necessary machines and equipment to prevent an outbreak of disease just like what happened in 2018. Speaking to Joy Business Senior Advisor for Fish Health Welfare at Norwegian Veterinary Institute, Dr. Kujie Kuchoses indicated that the current weak regulatory system needs to be strengthened to enhance the viability of laboratories across the country to withstand future talks. The Norwegian Veterinary Institute under the focal points for aquaculture and fish development program in Ghana has trained 17 aquatic and environmental health lab technicians across West Africa. Senior advisor for fish health welfare at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute, Dr. Kujo Koficho, bemoaned the inadequate facilities available to the industry affecting efficiency. Ghana as a sovereign state should be in position to understand that they cannot depend on donors all the time to do the very basic things that they need to do themselves for their survival. So if you have equipped your youth with understanding of their living environment, they should not be expecting anybody to do anything for you. Uh, about a week ago, we visited uh, a facility at Amran here, 
where it's supposed to be a state industry for both training and then a commercial production. Uh, that's a very nice uh, facility, but again, it lacks any proper uh, uh, laboratory to be able to uh, diagnose disease situations. So again, uh, empowering all the various lab in Koforidua, which is the hub of the industry, because it affects the Kosovo enclave, Kumasi, because of the ponds and all around, uh, uh, the Accra lab, and then this uh, with the University of Ghana, I think if, if they are properly resourced, there should not be any reason why they will not be successful in the industry. And then these facilities too can also provide, because there are none in the West Africa sub-region. And that's why you have the Nigerian also here. So it can provide a useful service to the sub-region. Lead trainer, Professor Emeritus of the Norwegian School of Veterinary Medicine, Professor Dr. Triff Pope, expressed optimism about the future of Ghana's aquaculture. These should be spokespersons both for the fish and the fish health, and they should also be good at informing the farmers on what are really good farming procedures in order to keep the fish as healthy as possible. This is a great job actually, coming to Ghana and have very motivated and good students is always very interesting and, 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 and very fun. So these are good people and there is hope for the future, I think. Here are some beneficiaries of the training. I'm yet to have the basic knowledge about histopathology and also gain more knowledge about disease diagnosis because disease, however, has been uh, a thing that has been reducing profitability of farmers and also causing several losses. So this is like a basic step in to be able to diagnose properly disease in fish. Training as a vet in the um, University of Ghana, we were given an introductory phase, or I would say an introduction to histopathology, and then working on a project with FAO, that's the tilapia, uh, tilapia link um, project, I also had a chance to do this. But now we have um, two professors in histopathology, come from the Norwegian Veterinary Institute and then the Veterinary School in Oslo to take us through. So like we did this from scratch. So like now you really appreciate whatever that we did all those times and those subsequent events. So this one an eye opener and two building on the knowledge that I already have. So it's been very insightful and it's very beneficial. Tourism operators are calling for a relook at the cost of domestic tourism to push for more revenue. According to the managing director for Adansi Travel and Tours, Gideon Asari, this has been a worrying trend, hence the need for further engagements to deliberate on how players can leverage the sector to support Ghana's economy. He's been speaking to Joy Business. Ghana's tourism sector remains a significant contributor to Ghana's GDP and continues to attract foreign investment. Meanwhile, managing director of Adansi Travel and Tours, Gideon Asari, said, the country has the potential to further develop tourism infrastructure and services near its well-known historical site, 334 miles of Atlantic coastline, featuring some of the West Africa's most attractive beaches, national parks, and wildlife reserves. We realize one of the setbacks for domestic tourism has been the cost of um, some complain that it's a bit costly for Ghanaians to travel around the country. So what we seek to do, or what we are doing at Advanced Travels to make things better, is to um, negotiate the rates with these um, hotels, with transport companies. And so when you, you join our package, you realize that it's very cheap compared to when you are doing it alone or on your own. So to make domestic tourism more um, sustainable, we need to look at those cost factors. Adanse Travels is marking a milestone of 11 years in creating breathtaking travel experiences. This is still Joy News from right back with World News. That's it for World News and of course, Patent Company here 
on Joy News Room with me, Pius Kojo Baka. For more stories, do log on to myjoyonline.com. Grateful serving you. The law is next. Do enjoy.